All right, we're going to try this again. We had uh, had a little incident with with that boy, and we got him to the emergency room. And so, make sure to be praying for him. And it uh, seemed like the devil has been at it since I got up this morning. <laughs> little things, and uh, and this is a bigger thing, but um, seemed like church barely gets started, and and here we are. And so. Uh, but we're not going to let him stop us. And so we, in fact, we pray God rebuke the devil and uh, give us a good service uh, this morning. So our message, this is part six of hindsight is 2020 and we're in John chapter 20, verse 20. And uh, this will be our final uh, final message uh, in this, if I can get through it today. And I'm going to try to do that. We need We need to be able to see clearly. Is what we've been talking about, and and to have the right vision, and you know where there's no vision, the people perish, and and so we need to be able to see spiritually speaking, and uh, you know I thought of I thought of this that Jesus called the Pharisees blind leaders of the blind, and they were they were the religious leaders, and yet Jesus said you're blind, and of course they got mad and said oh, so we're blind, you you calling us blind? And he basically said yeah, <laughs> and uh, and you see they knew the law, they they had much wisdom uh they were teachers uh of of the people in matters of of the bible and the law and religious things and all this stuff and yet they couldn't even see that they themselves were lost they were um uh, blind you know they were without the lord and they, they were blind um to to the real messiah you know, they, they taught the law that the Messiah was coming. Now he comes and they wouldn't even believe it was him, even though he did miracles and all the great things and proved it. And, uh, but they wouldn't believe and their hearts were hard and, uh, and they were blind. And, and that's why he told them that. And uh, they were blind to the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and so, in other words, they would perish. They're going to perish um, for lack of vision. For uh, on their own part, and uh, and you know people perish for lack of vision on our part because we don't see clearly enough to know God and know the Word of God and know how to deal with them or speak to them or preach to them or witness to them or whatever or how to handle things right. Um, and so uh, anyone, a lot of people will perish um, unless we can help them to see properly and. Uh, uh, you know, they, and they need somebody to lead them, to, to help them to see, not just with their physical eyes, but with their spiritual eyes. Now, we who know the Lord, we need to keep our spiritual glasses on. Here's, here's my physical glasses, <laughs> and y'all got them too. And, uh, but we need to keep our spiritual glasses on so we can continue to see clearly for other people's sakes and for those for for our own sakes and for other people's uh, those who need us to show them the way to Christ the 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 to light the way if you will and and make the path clear you know where they can see it now in John chapter 20 the disciples these the followers of Jesus they had been somewhat blind for a good while uh, now they they had they, they weren't completely blind they had eyes of faith they had given up all and you know, forsaken everything and followed Jesus and uh, they had believed on him but he kept saying they're going to crucify me they're going to put me to death and uh, and I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again and he kept telling them these things and it, they 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 couldn't see it uh, they didn't even they didn't catch it they they didn't catch on and and so uh, uh, but now. Jesus had died. He'd been gone for three days, you know, and three nights, three days, and or thereabout. And and uh, uh, and after his death, when everything was very real to the disciples, when everything was very serious, everything was very uh, scary and dangerous, and they they were in sorrow and confusion and in great need well they started seriously um, more than ever looking with their spiritual eyes they started looking for the lord before he was there and they kind of stood behind him let him do everything and didn't worry about nothing now they had stuff to worry about and uh, and so uh they they looked for jesus at the tomb okay when they couldn't find him they looked for him they 
They looked to the elders, the, those who knew him. That was a wise thing to do. Go find the people that know him. Maybe they know where we can find him. Maybe they know what's going on or where we can find the answers um, and insight and all of that on, on his whereabouts. They looked into God's word. They finally started looking into the Bible and the law and the word of God and saying, what does, what does God have to say? You know, maybe, maybe he knows what's going on where he is. And, um, and then they looked and looked and looked when they couldn't find him. They kept looking, and Mary Magdalene especially. And, uh, uh, and, and they looked for Jesus at church. They went, they went to church. That's a good thing to do. You can't find the Lord, go to church. Go and get in with God's people and go hear the word of God and ask God, you know, to show himself to you. And say, then, finally, they were gathered together and the doors were locked and they were scared and they were worried and they didn't know what to do. And then Jesus appeared. He showed up right there in the midst of them. Okay, look in verse 19, John 20, verse 19. And... The Bible says, Then the same day at evening, evening, being the first day of the week, Sunday, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. That's good stuff. Jesus sometimes will let you get in a place of fear and worry and sorrow and fret and everything, and he'll let you get to the place where you say, i got to find him. I need to know where the Lord is. I need him to be here with me. I can't do this. And But when it's the right time and in time, he's going to show up. He's going to, he's going to appear. He's going to, he's going to be there. And, uh, uh, and so suddenly he's right there with them. The doors were locked. That was what they needed. They needed Jesus to be there with them. Um, so now they and we too need to do this. This is my final point. Look intently at Jesus. Now all this time they were looking for him and wanting to have him with them and wanting to, to hear what he has to say and to see what they need to do. And, and, and they were gathering together and, and getting to church and trying to find out what to do next. But, but they couldn't find out what to do next except God leads them and shows them and tells them. And, uh, and he's the one they needed. And now all of a sudden he's there. And boy, when he shows up, that's when we need to look intently at him. So what did Jesus do that they saw for themselves? Well, first, he appeared. He simply appeared. Now, that startled them. <laughs> that freaked them out. They were already in fear, you know. <laughs> Can you imagine being in a room with, the, with people knowing that the people out there had just killed your master and they wanted you to? And they locked and bolted and, you know, the door. And, uh, and all of a sudden, this figure appears right in your okay, midst. This is what's going to happen. I'm going to go through this. And on the third day, I'm going to come back. Yep. It, it was he ironic. He told them over and over, but they didn't believe him, I guess. They didn't mm -hmm. faith. Yep. Mm -hmm. It was ironic that his disciples, he told them over and over, three days and three nights and I'm coming back, I'm rising from the dead and all that. And they, even on the third day, they were like, oh, he's dead. We don't know what we're going to do. And they didn't even But the Romans and the governors and the high priests and all of that, they got together and said, didn't he say he's coming back? <laughs> they, they heard him say that and believed it. Now, they didn't believe in his resurrection, but they believed something was going to happen in a few days. And, uh, uh, and so, but that's, the way the devil blinds our minds and messes everything up and, uh, and all of that. And so, uh, but now their eyes are starting to open. Now they're starting to see. We were missing this before, and he's starting to reveal it to them. Well, the best way to reveal it to them is to reveal it himself to them. So he shows up, and this figure appears right in the midst of them in that room. And, uh, uh, and so, uh, so here he is. It, you know, he appeared. And that startled them. It would any of us probably. Just when somebody, something appears before you, it usually freaks you out. And, uh, uh, and so they probably thought a spirit can appear and disappear even in a sealed room because it's a spirit. But can a person with a physical body appear where there's no way to get in? You know, in the room? And so the first thing he did, he appeared to them. And that, 
and, and that's a big thing. That's what we need. We need God to appear to us too. And there ought to be some fear when he shows up. There ought to be some respect and some trembling and some appreciation for what's going on. The second thing, though, is he spoke peace to them. And they heard it with their physical ears and their spiritual ears. Now he starts talking to them. They start listening and saying, this means more than just a phrase, peace, you know, peace be unto you. That was a common greeting back then, that kind of thing, grace and peace to you, you know. And But this time they said, hey, it ain't just that. And they needed some peace. He said, peace be unto you. He, 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 he needed to say that because, of course, for, first of all, they thought he was a ghost. Okay? But they also needed peace in their souls. They were troubled. Their master had died. They were hurting. They were full of sorrow and fear and worry and wonder and didn't know what to do next. He needed to say, it's going to be all right. Calm down peace be unto you. And so, uh, so he needed, you know, they needed that. And so, um, uh, and think of this, the Lord of everything who speaks peace to the wind and the sea. And they had seen him speak peace to the, to the storms and things when they were out there in the, in the sea of Galilee and that kind of thing. And they had seen the sea calm at just his word. And the, the same God, the same Lord, who speaks peace to the demon-possessed man and brings order and calm into a man that's full of chaos and confusion and trouble and, and, and all of that. Well, the same man that can speak peace to the storm and to the demon-possessed man, he can and will do the same for you and me. He can speak peace to our soul. Now we can tell the kids, we can tell the kids, calm down, quiet down. And they may quiet down, they may hush, they may not. <laughs> but to speak peace that makes you on the inside know everything's going to be all right. See, that's a different thing. The Lord Jesus, he can do that. Have you ever had those times when you strived to find the Lord and you needed some peace about something and you were troubled about it? And finally, finally, you heard a word from God. Maybe it was uh, half a verse, okay? Or, you know, uh, the, the preacher said, or in your devotions, or sometime, and there was half a verse that just jumped out at you. That was exactly what you were dealing with, and it was God saying something, you know. Uh, or maybe, um, you know, maybe it was... Uh, just a phrase or or something you know part of part of a verse or a part you know a scripture or something but it was from the lord to you specifically you were needing it and he appeared and gave a word to you and it was just what you needed just at the time you needed it and it just calmed and comforted and assured you that everything's okay or here's what, you know, I need to do, or, or whatever. And, uh, and you knew it was from the Lord. You knew it was Him. And listen, when Jesus shows up and He speaks peace to you, all of the argument and all of the stuff in all of the world that people say against you ain't going to change your mind. You're going to say, no, nope, it was God. I know it was Him. I, can, I can't tell you how, maybe, but I know that He helped me that day. I know that He was there for me. Why? Because He's my Lord. And I know him personally, and I have a relationship with him. And sometimes he knows he needs to come in and be there. He, sometimes he knows I'm seeking him. And so he needs to come in and be there. And he does, and he has. And it's those moments sometimes that we say, man, I need that kind of thing once in a while to remind me or, you know, for him to come for me or be there or whatever. Yes, ma'am. Those that were doubting amongst his disciples, he went to them and told them to put their finger in his side and to Exactly right. And that's my message today. Uh, you know, the first he appeared, next he spoke peace to them and, uh, you know, and talked to them and, uh, and spoke, you know, to their soul. And, and uh, you know, he can do that. Uh, Jesus speaks peace to the soul. And notice this. He didn't speak peace to the world, to the circumstances. He didn't say, world, cut this chaos out. My, my children here don't need to be afraid. 
he spoke peace to them. He showed up in their room and spoke peace to them. The world out there, the Romans and the Jews, were still in as much craziness and rage and turmoil and animosity against them. They were still going to come after them. But he spoke peace to them, and he was able to help them to have the peace that he was with them so that they could go out those doors and go and do the work of God and face the enemy and face the danger and the evil and the wickedness knowing he's with them. See, that's a, that's a different thing. Uh, Jesus, you know, God don't always fix your circumstances or change the problem, but he wants to work in you and change you or make you know that he's there. And if he's there, what have you got to be afraid of? You know, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And, uh, and so if I can go forward knowing he's there and, and knowing he just revealed himself to me, he showed up and he's told me to do this. And if he wants me to do it, I guess it's going to be all right. And he's going to have to do it with me and in me and, and all of that. And so, uh, so he gave him peace to go out in the midst of it all knowing he's with them. We often think or want him to change those circumstances and wonder why things don't change. <laughs> That's the, the, the problem with a lot of Christians. Why didn't he change that? I was praying that he would fix this situation. I was praying for a miracle. Why didn't he make that go away? Why didn't he make that stop? Or why didn't he make this pain go away? Why didn't he heal me? And why didn't he save that person and let, instead of letting them die? Yeah, all those things. And, and we don't, and, but he, he's trying to do something in me. He's trying to do something in you. And he's trying to show himself to you and, and show you that, that he's... He's got this, but it ain't always what we think. It ain't always the way we want it. And, uh, and so uh, he's wanting to calm and assure something in your soul and strengthen you and, and by teaching you to know and see and walk with him. Okay? And also, I think his presence with them spoke to them. Once they figured out it was him and they weren't afraid of it being a ghost anymore, I think his presence speaks to him when you know god is there without even meaning to you ain't afraid or you ain't as afraid you ain't that worried about it you ain't that anxious you you know it just calms you just him being there and that's what we need so much of the time is just to make sure that we're in tune in touch with the lord and that he goes with us or or, or that we walk uh walk with him there's great joy in being with god it's kind of like with your family whether it be your parents or your kids or your grandkids or whatever, there's great joy in knowing they're coming to see you, you know, and they want to be with you and, and or doing something with, a, with them or, or whatever, just having them there. And, and, but imagine the Lord who's got everything in his control. Boy, there's some peace and, and joy that comes with that. Okay. Now, he also knew, Jesus also knew they needed to know it was really him. And this is where we're going to get to the point you, you, just, you just mentioned. He wanted them, them to know it was really him. And uh, that he had risen from the dead. The last th thing they had seen and, and experienced was that he died. And it was a few days later and everything was upside down. And they were, you know, in fear and worry. And they didn't have their Lord around. And they didn't understand. And he wanted to make sure that they knew that it was really him and that he had risen from the dead. And he wanted them to know if whether or not he was just a spirit or a person with a physical body. Okay? And whether or not it was the same body they crucified. You see, uh, a lot of times the devil will send some ghost or some spirit or something and uh, to, to show up to you and he'll, he'll have them imitate, you know, somebody you know or something and, uh, uh, and it'll make you think, oh, that's them. But you do all the checkpoints and you're going to find some of them ain't right. There's some things wrong there. There's some things missing. And, but when the Lord shows up, it's it they're all going to check check out and uh, uh and so he shows up uh and and he's there and uh he wanted them to know that uh, he was crucified and that he rose again and that it's really him and it's really his body um uh that, that he has there that he was crucified with the same body that he died in the same one now it's healed it's no longer in pain and it has the scars rather than the wounds and uh, but it's him. So watch what he did. Look in verse 20. It says, 
and this is hindsight is 2020 and this is chapter 20 verse 20 it says and when he had so said he had just said peace be unto you when he had so said he showed unto them his hands and his side then were the disciples glad when they saw the lord boy that's good stuff man they were glad they had seen the Lord. They, they get to say, it's him. It really is our master. It really is the Lord. It, it, it really, he really is the Messiah. Who else could come back from the dead? You know, he's not just a ghost either. He wanted them to see and touch his physical body and know that it wasn't just a spirit, but it was God and his flesh. He's going to say in a little while, see me and, and experience that I have flesh and bones. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones like I have. Now, you'll notice he doesn't say flesh and blood. His blood had been shed, and I believe it was in heaven on the mercy seat, taking care of our sins and, and all of that. And uh, uh, But he still had flesh and bones. He still was in uh, the same body. And so, uh, so here he is. And, and so he, he, he's appeared to them. He spoke peace to them. The third thing he does is he opened his hands to them. Okay? First to show them the scars. And I think he, he said, come here, look at this. And he opens his hands. He says, check this out. See these scars? You remember them from the other day? Remember how they got there? <laughs> remember when I was crucified? You know? And uh, remember they hung me on the cross? And uh, they took me down? Well, it's really me. And, uh, and so they show, he shows them, you know, he opens his hands, shows them the scars. They needed to see that it was really him, that he'd really died and rose again, just like he said. I think they start remembering. Yeah, he did say that. Why didn't, why haven't I thought of that? Why didn't I remember? Why have I been so worried? You know, and it, it probably started coming back to him. And now the strength of everything you taught them and what they had just gone through and him being with them is all coming together. You know, it, it's all uh, becoming real and, and it's, it's all gelling, you know, in their minds and in their hearts. Um, and so they figured out he, it's really him, just like he said. Figured out he's a living savior who's going to go with them and never leave them or forsake them. See, Peter before denied him. But now he's saying, I'll never deny him again. I doubted him. I wondered, you know, we went to the tomb this morning and uh, they said he wasn't in there. And we went and uh, I didn't believe it. John saw the napkin and stuff and John believed, but I didn't. I still didn't. And uh, But it won't happen again. You see, they, 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 their Lord was with them, and, and he, was, he was working all these things in them. And, uh, and so they figured out, we have a living Savior. That's something we need to figure out. He, I have a Savior who, who still, 2,000 years ago he died, but he rose again. And he saved me, and he's still here. You know, it ain't just the day I, that I got saved and that, that he quit there. No, he's still here for me, and uh, he's still alive. And he's still alive from the dead. And, uh, he, you know, he's, he's the Messiah. He's God. He's my Savior. And so, so uh, uh, he's a living Savior, and he'll, he'll be with me. The scars also, I realize this, the scars also were a conviction to them. Think about that. He showed them the scars. They had sinned, yet he's the one who suffered and died. It's supposed to be me on that cross. I chickened out and ran off. He stuck around and let them do it to him instead of me. When they saw the scars, it probably brought some conviction. This is, he is the Savior. He is the Redeemer. He's the righteous Son of God. I am unworthy. When we look at his scars, it ought to make us see how righteous he is and how unworthy and sinful that we are. And so it, 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 it's no doubt a conviction to us. Peter probably thought, I was busy denying him while they were crucifying him. He held his hands out for the nails to be put in so he could now hold his hands out to me. I think that's good stuff. What did the others think? You know, what were their sins and what were, when they saw his scars, what did, what passed through their mind and what was their realization? He died 
for me. He suffered and did nothing wrong. I haven't suffered. I did everything wrong. You know, what, what, what did they, what did they, they think of? <clears throat> what, um, what do you see and think when you see his scars? What, what goes through your mind? You know, do, does it make you realize your, your position and his position? You know, that's why it's important to look at his scars some of the time. It's important once in a while to remember. You know, and I think, and that's why they sing those songs, the only thing, you know, that's going to be in heaven are the scars in the, hand of, the hands of Jesus. You know, that, that uh, I forget how some of the songs go, but they, they talk about, um, you know, everything else will be made new, but those scars are going to be there, and I think they will. I think Jesus is going to carry the same body that has those scars in it, and when we're in heaven, we're going to be reminded and we're going to see what he did for us. That is what God created everything for. Because he wanted us and he made a way for us through his son. And, and so salvation, everything, it revolves around the cross. You know, the cross of Jesus Christ. And, and so uh, it should remind us of our sins and his righteousness. And oh, how righteous he is was and still is to sacrifice himself for you. Now, he opened his hands and showed him the scars. I believe he opened his arms as well. As if to say, you've been hurting. You've been troubled. You've been suffering for several days now. I haven't been around and uh, you didn't know what to do. But here I am. Now, now come here. You know, I, I think he opened his arms uh, to indicate that he's a loving Lord, a loving Father who will always receive us with open arms. When we get to the place where, he say, where we say, I've sinned so much, I'm so rotten, he wouldn't take me back. That's a lie of the devil. He died so that he could receive anyone. He died in our place for our sins because he loved us so much that he wants us to come to him so he can put his arms around us so that he can welcome us with open arms. Okay? And so, and the, the third thing is this, he also showed them his side. Look in verse 20, the second part there says, and when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Okay? So he wanted everyone to see and feel and know him personally, okay, and, and intimately. And uh, that's where your bosom is. That's where your heart is. You know, the reason he had the scar on his side was because they pierced his heart. They, they stuck that spear in there and split him open and, and, and stuck it through his heart. You know, that's why water and blood came out. They say the stress of that kind of situation causes a, a sack of water to form around the heart. Well, there's blood in the heart and there was water and uh, he had died of a broken heart because he loved us so much. And, uh, and so, and, and, but that's what that scar, that's, that's where it was. And so, um, so he shows them his side. He, he wanted them to see that. Uh, but one person was missing. Look in verse 24 through 27. And it says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So here they're in the upper room. The eleven were there, but Thomas wasn't there, so only ten of the disciples were there. And uh, it says, verse 25 says, The other disciple, therefore said in him, that's John, he always called himself the other disciple, it says, he said unto him, we have seen the Lord. Okay, so if you, the, the next day or sometime, they said, Thomas, John said, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. But see, Thomas wasn't there. Uh, it says, but he said unto them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger, in, finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again, his disciples um, uh, were with him, were within, and Thomas was with them. You can bet, he said, y'all ain't getting away from me. <laughs> I'm going to be with y'all this time. <laughs> if he shows up again, I will be there, okay? It says, then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, 
peace be unto you. He comes in, he says it again. Verse 27, then saith he to Thomas. Okay, he, he specifically turned to Thomas because he knew that he had said that. He knew that he wanted to see him himself, and that it was a special thing. He said, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And so he opens, Jesus opens his bosom. He, he must have to remove his robe or whatever to show them the scar over his heart to show him his bosom and uh, uh, to, 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 to show his heart. Like a mother, you know, to her sucking baby, she opens her bosom to, for him to suck and for, to nurture him. And uh, our Lord is a father. He's a redeemer. Okay, who always shows himself open-handed and open-hearted for all of his faithful followers. See, the world don't know Jesus because they don't know Jesus. They call him everything in the world, and they say he's an unfair God, or that, that he's out there, or that you can't know him, or whatever. We know differently. He's a risen Savior. He's a living Savior. He's a loving Father. He died in my place. While I was sinning, he was dying for my sin. He loved me so much. And so he opened his hands to them. So they know his voice. I thought of this. What does it say? What did he say? My sheep know my voice. They hear my voice and they know me and they follow me and I know them. And uh, uh, it's a sweet, tender, familiar voice. I think when he said, peace be still, they thought, that sounds like the Lord. That doesn't sound like no ghost. That sounds like our master. You know, I recognize that voice. They see, they hear his voice. They see his facial expression. They probably saw his eyes and knew his eyes, how he had looked on them before and how with, with love and all that toward them. Okay? They see and feel the marks, the scars in his hands and in his side. Yep. It's our Lord, all right. No doubt about it. It's him. Boy, talk about relief. Talk about excitement. I mean, a little while ago, they were nervous and troubled and confused and worried and didn't know what to do. And now all of a sudden, ah, the Lord is here. He's, he's right there. Now, I want to talk to you about two things. Mm, take, not take too long. How to look at him. Yes, ma'am. Can we back up? Sure. Um, before Christ died on the cross for us, wasn't God so angry that he was going to uh, just get rid of everybody again? All Everybody turned to sin and he was angry, so he was going to destroy us. But Jesus told him not to. They're your people. You created them. And, and he's the one that made the sacrifice so that we can get in good with God again. Uh, I don't know. I, I haven't. I don't think it was like that. God. God is a just God, and He couldn't allow one sin to go unpunished because He's holy and just, um, and, and so He had to punish or execute the penalty for sin. The only penalty for sin was death. Right. But God was a loving God who said, "I created them in My image. I want them to be with Me forever." but someone has to die. There has to be death. They've sinned. They deserve to die. And so, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave. You see, God gave his son willingly and gladly to pay that penalty so he could have us. And he, he had to reject or turn from his sin and or her son and place all the, the world the world's sin on him so that he could have us. But I, I don't think, I, I think that if Christ hadn't died, he would have had to destroy us all, either in hell or whatever, sooner or later. And uh, because we're just that's full what, of that's sin. That's what I thought. I guess more, um, listen during my, when I'm not doing anything, I listen to different preachers or evangelists that I like that, you know, you know, speak the word and all that. And that's what they were saying, you know, like, um, God is a just God, full of love, mm -hmm. and we, He created all of us in His own image, but yet 
everyone just turned to sin. Mm -hmm. Everyone became sinners and and I guess he was so angry that he was going to pull another, like Noah with the flood. Mm -hmm. But um, Jesus, you know, stepped forward and told him, no, they were people and he was willing to bear, you know, take it upon himself to die for us and all that. But then, I don't know, it, it's just, yeah, well, and you got to be careful with something because sometimes you're going to get teaching that is somebody's ideas that don't match the Word of God. Yeah. As far as I know in the Word of God, even in Noah's time, yeah. God loved the world of wicked people so much. The whole world had become so wicked. He said, I'm going to destroy them all because they're, they're, the thoughts and intents of their heart are only evil continually. Mm -hmm. And so it has to be done. But... He, he found Noah, a righteous man, who was a man after his own heart, who found grace in the eyes of the Lord and all that. And, and, but he let Noah, while he's building that boat, 120 years preach to the people of the world that if they'll get on this boat, they can be saved. God wanted to save them back then, but he left the choice up to them. And they chose and they to did. stay out, and they died, and they suffered yeah. and perished. And, but that was an example. And, but God, remember the rainbow, he said, I'll never do that again, not with water. Yeah. And... And so the the intention of God was, I'm going to send the Savior. That was the example of the Savior, Christ. The, the ark is probably an example of Christ. And when you're in Christ, you're safe because he's the only one that can save you. And so, but as far as I know in the Bible, you won't find anywhere. Uh, because when he sent Jesus, he didn't send him down as the judge. He sent him down as the Savior with love and mercy ready to forgive that's why the he hardly ever got mad and even when they everything they did to him and they mocking and they went against him and they called him names and even compared him to the devil and everything and he still loved him right you see he came to save and who can do that <laughs> i know i know we have trouble as christians who know all of this and and uh, but but see the next time god comes he's going to judge the earth with fire but he's going to rescue his children out that's us in the rapture kind of like the ark he's gonna make sure that we're out of this world then he's gonna judge the world who rejected him you see it was still their choice he wanted to save all of them that's why he died for all of them. and uh, but it was still their choice and he's going to do that so next time he comes back he is coming in anger uh, but as far as i know when he sent jesus he wasn't mad he was glad he get, got to give his son and jesus was glad to do it you know, um, and so that we could be saved. And so, um, so that's what it is. Maybe that'll help you out a yeah, little bit he, with that. He, he did. He took it upon, he took the, the sins of the world upon himself. But there was a moment when he wanted to have that cup passed from him. But he said to the Father, let it be your will. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, people dispute as to why he did that. I think, and I preached on this a year or two ago, uh, I think that that, that cup, um, I believe, was the sins of the world. He was going to have to drink that cup to the dregs, drink all of it. And uh, that he was going, and God and sin don't mix. He hates sin. And so I think in... In his flesh, he obviously was troubled because he knew what he was fixing to suffer, that that was there. But I don't think he hesitated one second in saying, I, I'm not going to do it or I, might, I don't want to do it. I think he wanted to do it right up to the end because he loved us that much. And But I think the part of, he said, if this cup can pass from me, if there's any other way, if there's any other way I can get rid of their sins without having to become sin, you know. I think it was some of that. And he realized. And there was Satan too right there. Right there. The yeah. And so he suffered. I think he suffered. We can't even understand how, what he went through. Because he's God and man. Right. And went through all the torments of hell right right in that. Um, and the torments of physical and spiritual and emotional. Every kind of suffering there was. And some of it we, we'll never understand. And, and so. he defeated it. And he won. Yeah. That's what's so good. He won. And if I'm in him, I've won too. And so, and so that's good. 
And so, and, and, and but what do we do as Christians? We get, we get to forgetting him or we get to looking to ourselves or to the world for answers or peace or we go on without him. And we need to get our vision right. We need to look at him. And, and so through all of these lessons or messages, we've talked about how that the, the people, you know, the apostles and all of the disciples, they were looking for him. They were looking for him with the, 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 those who knew him. And they were looking for him in the scriptures. And they looked for him at church. And, uh, and finally, he shows up. Now when he's there, we need to look at him. And how do we look at him? Well, he beckoned them to look at him. Come here. Come here. It's me. I want to show you the scars. I want to show you that it's me. I want you to check me out head to toe. And no doubt he showed them his feet as well and the scars and all that. And, uh, <clears throat> and so they looked intently at him. I think they probably come around and, you know, <laughs> sized him up. You know, they said, show me, turn your hand over. Is, the, is it on the backside too? You know, I think they, they did a thorough job. And that's what they ought to do. And that's what Jesus wants us to do. Come and know me. Get to know me. Learn of me through and through, top to bottom, inside and out. He wants us to know him. And, uh, and so uh, they looked intently at him. Now note, in the Bible, there's many words for the word look. And I looked up a bunch of these. We should learn to fix our eyes on the Lord in some of these ways. Here's one of the words. Behold. If you ever hear, see the word behold, He's saying, look, look on purpose, okay? The word behold simply means to see. Very simply, to look, to see, all right? Another word is gaze, G-A-Z-E, -E, to gaze upon. It means to inspect. It means to consider. A gaze isn't just a passing glance. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. huh, it's to look at for a while and to analyze every detail of it and to inspect it. And, and you know, and, and that kind of thing, to consider it. Huh, that, that's interesting, okay? Another word is this, observe. You ever observe something? <laughs> it means give heed to, take seriously. Stand and watch and keep watching. You ever go to a fireworks show? You observe, you stand there and go, wow, that was a cool one. Oh, that was, that was a neat one. Oh, I like those loud ones, you know. And you do it for an hour, you know, and as long as it's going, you're, you, you don't hear one little thing pop and go, well, okay, if that's it, yeah, and you don't take off. You know. You're going to observe, you're going to check it out. And, and, uh, and we ought to take heed and, and keep watching. Keep watching, you know. Uh, you know, in the Bible, in the book of John, matter of fact, some of the disciples and all, when they first found Jesus, they went and found, Andrew went and found his brother and said, "Come and see, I found the Messiah." You know, and uh, uh, and these different ones, they they found the Lord and they went and found their family or their friends and they said, "Come, come and see." You know, the man that showed me everything, the lady at the well, he, he told me all about my life. Come, come and see. You know, and uh, we ought to have that attitude. I want you to come and see Jesus. I want you to see him. Like I see him. I want you to be able to look at him and observe him like I do. You know, another word is watch. Just watch. You know, it means to look about. means to spy or to keep watch or to guard. Think about that too. Take heed. To guard. in a little while when we're done. I'll holler at her. And so, uh, but to guard, and but, but think about that, to keep, the Bible says in Proverbs 4.23, I think it says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep means to, to guard, guard your heart. Watch, watch out, watch, watch over, you know, protect that thing. And uh, uh, to, to guard something like a prisoner or whatever, you guard them and, uh, uh, and that kind of thing. And so uh, to watch over. Uh, anyone ever say to you, would you watch this thing for me and take care of it? Maybe it's a pet. Um, maybe, it's, maybe it's a baby. Maybe it's your house. 
You know, maybe it's, um, you know, maybe it's your something valuable. And a baby is valuable. Your pet is something you need taken care of. If you say watch it, you don't, you don't just mean make sure it's there one time and then leave it alone for four days. I remember when I was in Dulce, there was a fella, um, he said, he said, would you mind watching my house and my horses for a couple of days? I'm going to be gone. And he said, you can stay in the house and, and sleep in there. You can eat what you want. He said, but if you will, feed the horses. Yeah, he said, feed the horses and make sure they're And I said, yeah, sure, that sounds like good. And he said, I'll pay you, you know, a little bit. And I thought, I could use that, and I'll be a blessing to him. Well, he had left the gate unlatched on his horses. And it had snowed like the day, bef day or two before, and there was about that much snow everywhere, and it was kind of hard and crunchy. And I went out and fed the horse and got it, and I didn't pay attention. And I went back in, and a little while later, I went back out check him, and it's gone. The gate's standing open. All right, cowboy. <sighs> and I had to be a cowboy. And it was like 10 o'clock at night. And I thought, I'm, I thought I'm going to stay here and watch a little TV and relax. And all I got to do is watch these horses that's in a pen. And uh, instead, I'm like, and I look, and because it was snowy, it was white enough, light enough outside, I looked down there, and way down there, that was his horse trekking down the middle of the field going that way. Oh, all I had was these little old shoes, little old fly, and I got I got them on and I took off. I got me a feed sack or something, you know, to try to, and I chased that horse for three or four hours. It was like four in the morning, and I chased it around the field, and finally, I don't remember if I caught it or if I finally got it back up to the pen, and, and I was like, but see, to watch something is to take care of it and guard it, and that's your responsibility, you know. And, and so to watch... Jesus said, behold, gaze, take heed, you know, observe, watch. He wants them to watch him. Another word I thought of was study. <clears throat> now, it's more of getting it in your brain, but you, you have to look at something repeatedly and listen and, and, and absorb it and you know, get it in there, you know. Give diligence to learn is what I was talking about. Apply yourself to know something. To study something means you got to you know, get in there and do that. And so, um, uh, and here's a few other words. Regard, it just simply means to gaze or behold. It's another way of putting it. Uh, perceive means to recognize, to know by sight, to learn to spot by experience. To, 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 to perceive is to see something and say, eh, I know what you're doing, or I know what's going on. I've been through this before, you know, and, uh, and so uh, another one is discern, means to look intently at, to pay attention to, to distinguish between things, to tell the difference, to discern. My point is, Jesus beckons us to look at him. To the world, he was a plain, ordinary, you know, guy, uh, didn't look any different than anybody else uh, on, the, on, on the cross. He was hideous and bloody and repulsive, and he was marred more than any man to the world. But to us, he was beautiful. Because that death, that suffering was in my place so that I wouldn't have to. Because he loved me that much, he wanted to save me. Now let me go through the rest of this quickly, and I'll wrap it up. The next thing is this. So we need to know how to look at him, but we also need to know when and where to look at him. Okay? We need to look back at Jesus. And we're talking about hindsight is 2020. Look into the Bible and study him. We should look into the word of God and find what it says and study his example and study what it says about him and what he did and how he walked and how he talked and what he did. All that business. And learn of him. Copy him. We should mimic him. You know, the kids go along and they mimic their favorite basketball star or, or some other hero, you know. We ought to mimic Jesus. We ought to say, I want to look and walk and talk and act just like him. <clears throat> Hindsight is twenty let Let's look back and find and have some wisdom. We can look back in the Word of God and say, they were foolish. I'm going to be wise. They did it wrong. I'm going to do it right. Or look back in my life and say, how did I know Jesus? Or what happened? Or what have I done wrong? And do it right. And then we should look at Jesus right now. He's alive right now. When you're suffering from physical pain, look at the scars on his body and realize he suffered physically for me. By his stripes, we are healed. That's good stuff. 
when you're suffering from exhaustion, tiredness. Yes. Look at him who didn't have a place to lay his head and chose to pray and continue blessing and helping people and healing and preaching and teaching rather than getting him some rest. You know, we should we should look look at him and and uh, uh, in the right ways and uh, uh, look look at his scars and remember your sins Rem and remember his love and mercy and righteousness. Learn to keep your eyes fastened on the Lord at all times. That's my main point. We need to learn to look for and look at Jesus all the time. In Psalms one twenty one, uh, I'm going to read that whole chapter real quick. He says. Uh, here in just a minute. We, we ought to look at him who is alive right now and is here with open arms and, and an open heart to welcome and help you. Okay? Psalm one, 121. I may have said that wrong. Psalms 121. He says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which maketh heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved, he that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. That's good stuff. He's alive today. And he can help me today. And if I just look to him. And that's what he wants us to do. And so we should look back at Jesus. We should look at Jesus now. And then we should look forward to Jesus. Did you know he's coming back again? Yes. He's coming. It, it may be very soon. There's no way around it. He's coming back. The world is a mess. It's in a mess. But he's going to fix it. Sinful mess. Yep. But he's going to fix it. That's something to look forward to. We can say, ugh. Boy, you look at this world, no wonder you're depressed. But you can look forward to Jesus coming and you can say, it's going to be all right, he's going to fix it, he's going to take care of it. Look forward to having a glorified body like his. One of these days, we're going to have a body like his. One of these days, I ain't going to need these glasses, I ain't going to have gray hair, my hip ain't going to hurt, my back ain't going to go out. <laughs> you know. And one of these days, I'm going to be able to fly and run and jump and not even get out of breath. You know. And But I'm also going to be able to see him with my physical yet glorified eyes. I'm going to be able to see God in his glory. I don't know how that's going to be, but it's going to be good. We ought to be looking forward to seeing him. Okay? We should get anxious to see him. We should look toward the east every day, hoping a different sun will rise, will come up. You know, rather than the, the sun, S-U-N, we ought to be looking for the son of God, you know, to come back. Um, remember, Paul said... There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. We should be loving the idea of him coming back. And we should be living in such a way where we know him and we walk with him and we'll be glad to see him and not ashamed. So in conclusion, we need right vision or people will perish. We need to learn to look back, to look around and see what's what's going on right now and what our next step is, we need to learn to look forward. None of these can be done without the Lord. Yes, ma'am. Um, when I think of that, when the Christ is going to soon return, it could be tonight, tomorrow, who knows, but I get sad when I think about my family, my relatives, 